All right, let's get started. Uh, I'm Mike from TileDB Marketing. A few quick housekeeping notes. First, we're recording this meeting, uh, so we'll distribute that recording uh, in the next few days. Uh, second, we're, we're taking your questions um, via the Zoom webinar Q&A panel. So this is an important bit. Um, down in the bottom, you might see a, a chat bubble. Uh, please don't ask questions there. We won't uh, be monitoring it. Please look for the two chat bubbles that are labeled Q&A. Um, it just helps us manage things better as they come in. Um, so again, please use that Q&A panel um, to ask your questions throughout the workshop. Uh, anything that we don't cover during the course of the workshop, uh, we'll address those questions at the end. And then uh, finally, just a quick reminder to sign up for TileDB Cloud. If you want to follow along with uh, some of the examples, head over to tiledb.com. You'll get $10 in free credits as a new sign up. You don't have to put in a credit card or anything like that. So that's it. Uh, I'm joined by Stavros, the original creator of TileDB. And we also have Norman, our geospatial expert. And uh, now, I'll just uh, turn things over to you, Stavros, to kick things off. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mike. Um, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm very happy to be doing this. This is our first uh, uh, webinar slash uh, workshop. So we're, we're very happy to share with you what we have been doing with TalDB over the past uh, uh, several years. years. Uh, so let me tell you what we're going to do in this uh, workshop and what you will learn. First, we will cover a few things about TalDB, the background, what it is, uh, and why it is very good for LiDAR uh, data specifically. And then we will, I will turn it to Norman, who is going to walk through several different demos so that you see how we ingest data, how we slice, how we explore uh, LiDAR uh, data. We're going to cover what is open source, what is found in the commercial um, uh, product. And uh, hopefully this is going to give you a, a very good first idea about LDB and, and its applications to LiDAR. I'm very happy to, to be seeing questions and we will, um, we will even be stopping um, the demos if, if there is something unclear. Um, with that, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to just present a couple of slides um, on TileDB and you know the general background. All right. So um, a few things about who we are. Um, TalDB started uh, um, as a research project when I was at MIT and Intel uh, between 2014 and 2017. I was working at the inter intersection of uh, uh, high performance computing uh, at the Intel uh, Parallel Computing Lab, but also databases at MIT. So we do have deep roots at the intersection of, of HPC and databases and, uh, and data science. Um, we have raised uh, some capital over, over the years. We have 34 employees. Um, right now, we're a remote team uh, since, uh, since day one. Uh, we have a team in Greece. We have most of the people in the US, and we have some people in the UK. Um, and we have customers uh, across the board. Uh, I'm going to tell you very soon why. Uh, we are so diverse. Uh, um, TALDB is being used in telecom, genomics, health and life sciences, and many more. Um, so what is TALDB? Uh, TALDB is the first and only universal database. And what does that mean? It's, uh, it's quite bold as a statement, but uh, hopefully we will back it up over the next couple of months as you will see more and more uh, webinars and workshops from us. But for, uh, for the purposes of this uh, webinar, effectively what we're saying is for all your geospatial data that you have come across, including of course LIDAR uh, in the point cloud category, but also SAR, optical, earth observation, weather, hyperspectral, we can cover all of that in a single system, in a unified solution. And beyond that, for example, genomics, biomedical imaging, video, of course, tables, and finally, even machine learning models. And this seems very, very diverse. So how do we pull this off? Well, the, the main observation is, so by the way, when, when we say we, we can accommodate these use cases and we can, we can handle them very well, we don't mean that we just can do it because you can always create an aggregation solution that has a thousand different aspects and it covers all the solutions. That's not what we mean here. We want to cover everything very efficiently and very cost effectively. And we want to do it with a single system, right? We want to build a single code base that covers 90, 95% of the common stuff across all those applications. And then we will be integrating for 5% uh, for the particular domain that we're working with. And this is going to become clearer uh, in the next slides. So the secret source in TALDB is this very powerful structure. 
um, called the multidimensional array. This is just a simple example in two dimensions. And it's extremely important to differentiate between those two flavors, the dense array and the sparse array. So the dense array on the left, um, and this is a two dimensional example, um, the dense array uh, is comprised of cells uh, across um, uh, uniquely ident identified by the, by the coordinates of the dimensions. And every cell has a value. Even if it is empty, we need to put something in there. Zero, uh, now it, it, it has to be occupied. And you can have arbitrary array metadata inside each cell. You can store as many different values of different types as you like. Um, we call those attributes. You can have labels. So it's, it's a very, very flexible and powerful model. And then the sparse array is very similar, but it extends the dense array in a couple of extremely important respects. The very the most important difference is that the majority of those cells in the sparse array are empty and we should not materialize them because they're so vast that we either shouldn't because the, the storage explodes or, or we just can't uh, because the domains are infinite. And we do support infinite domains because we support even real domains like floats and doubles or strings in, in the case of uh, sparse. In the dense case, the dimensions are integrals. And also we, we support multiplicities of the cells. This is very, very important also for LIDAR, but also for tables as, as we can uh, show later. But the rest of the respects are the same. And the rest of the principles, again, and, and the code base is the same. There are, there are a lot of similarities there. And the biggest position of our company is that all data, regardless the, the vertical, regardless the, the terminology, can, uh, but most importantly, should, uh, be modeled SRAs because you're going to get the efficiency and the, you're going to get the unification of data management uh, uh, built on top of those arrays. All right, so how do we build a universal database using this data structure? So think at the bottom, any kind of backend. It should be anything. It, it, it could be the cloud, but it, should, it could also be your laptop. It could be a robot. It doesn't matter. It, it, it should be anything. And then at the very top, um, think of any programming language, think of distributed computational frameworks like Spark and Dask, think of SQL engines like Presto and MariaDB, think of um, visualization tools, it could be anything. Now, we have two offerings, and that, that's the way we build it. We build it very, very modularly. We have the open source component, which we call TalDB Embedded, and you can find it on GitHub. And this is a, this is a storage engine. This is a library, it's, a, it's embedded. It, it, it doesn't work as a server. Um, it's built in C and C++. And this is what gives you all the performance for storing and accessing arrays. And it builds a very powerful format, which is cloud native, it is columnar. And we're going to explain what the implications of these are. It supports parallel IO, everything is multi-threaded in, uh, in TalDB. Um, and also it, uh, it builds data version in time traveling, which is quite novel. And this is built into the format and built into the, uh, the, the open source storage engine. So that's, that's the core. And on top of that, we build a commercial offering, which is called TalDB Cloud. And you can find it here at cloud.taldb.com. Uh, this is what adds data governance, sharing across organization, within an organization, across organizations, or across the globe. And also it automates all the scalable compute that you need, especially for applications like, like LiDAR, and it does it in a serverless manner. Uh, this means that you don't need to spin up a cluster. You don't need to, to monitor, you don't need to, um, to pay for idle compute. You, you just pay for whatever you use uh, in, in the SaaS product. And it has Jupyter Notebook integration so that you can do exploratory analysis and dashboards. We're gonna show you a lot of that uh, today. And we take it to the extreme to integrate those offerings with the higher level applications. Like we have six APIs and growing, the integrations with, with data, with SQL engines, with computation frameworks, as I mentioned, uh, with PDAL and GDAL, which Norman uh, is gonna talk about. Uh, and we do that with zero copy techniques. We do not open ODBC connectors or JDBC connectors, if, if you're familiar with that. We do everything very, very efficiently through zero copy techniques. And on top of everything, you can build any kind of dashboard, any kind of visualization application, which now scales because all the computations are done and the slicing and the data management is done by a powerful backend. And now you can build 
your own dashboards on top extremely easily and extremely efficiently. So this is the landscape uh, of, of our software stack. And putting, it, putting everything together, this is how it looks like you, you can think of any kind of data format like LAS or COGS um, and VCF from genomics, CSVs for tables. We convert everything. We have the ingestors. We give you the ingestors. We convert everything in some flavor of an array, either dense or sparse, depending on the application. Again, we choose the dimensions. We, we choose pretty much everything um, uh, depending on, on the application. Those arrays are stored in some kind of a shared file system, which scales like S3 or Azure Blob Storage or Google Cloud Storage or MinIO, Luster, it could be pretty much anything. And then we, we handle all the governance and scalable computing in TalDB Cloud. And of course, the TalDB Cloud itself is running TalDB embedded for the storage and access. And all the data is open spec, the, the, the storage engine for accessing is open source, this will never change. And then you get all the integrations uh, that, that, that you're familiar with and, and that you prefer. All right, so this is the, the main idea of TalDB, but why LiDAR? So first of all, uh, LiDAR data can be modeled extremely intuitively as a 3D, very sparse array with real dimensions. You have doubles, for example, three dimensions, the space is infinite, right? It's massively empty. And you have points of interest in this three-dimensional space. So this is perfect for, for a storage engine and, and, and the database, uh, like, like an array database like TalDB. And we can have multiple projections. Of course, there are a lot of peculiarities with LiDAR, and that's why we are bringing domain experts like, like Norman that understand this, this problem very, very deeply. Um, the other um, benefit is that TalDB is cloud-native, so uh, whether you run it on your laptop or the cloud, it's the exact same thing. And we, again, took it to the extreme to optimize for the cloud. And we will explain in, in future workshops how this works and how to build the cloud native format. It's also columnar, which means that uh, you can sub-select on fields like red, green, blue, for example, for LiDAR, ignoring all the rest of the fields. So it becomes very, very efficient. And we index with our trees. And our trees in this particular case, they're excellent for, uh, for slicing and pruning a lot of uh, redundant um, uh, points. Um, another big benefit is the interoperability. So it's not just a parsing library, it's, it's an engine. It integrates with so many languages. It integrates even with SQL. You can run SQL queries on LiDAR data very, very efficiently. Um, so you get all of that kind of for free because it just works. Once the, your data is in TalDB, everything we build on top works with your data. Um, the versioning and time traveling, this is extremely important. Uh, you, you can undo, you can go back and see what happened if you updated the data set in, in a way you didn't want to. You, you, you can reproduce everything uh, when it comes to, to data ingestion. Um, the scalable compute, of course, which we make extremely easy. Norman will, will show you today how this is done. Um, no clusters, no infrastructure that you need to, to, de to deploy on your own. Um, and, and of course, we, you can share data and code on TalDB Cloud. I hope we, we will have a little bit of time to show this to you and you can even monetize it without having to go to, an, to another marketplace. You, we obviate completely the need of having to go to some kind of a storage server to download files only to re-host them yourselves to rehost it yourselves and, and do your analytics. Uh, sharing and monetization is built into this analytics platform. So, so it makes it very, very easy. And if there is one takeaway, uh, hopefully from today is that we are not building yet another format here. Uh, in fact, we're seeing the exact opposite. We, we are building an extremely powerful format and yet we're not telling you to just adopt the format. We're telling you that you need to adopt engines, not, not formats and parsers. Like a, a, proper data management engines, like what you're going to see today with TalDB, um, that take it to the next level when it comes to data management, whether it is LiDAR or genomics or tables, it doesn't matter. So that's it for me. Um, I will turn to Norman uh, very soon. Just, uh, just to let you know, we are hiring. We have a, uh, an amazing team and uh, um, we, we're hiring across the board for the core, but also, you know, domain expertise, especially for uh, for geospatial. So please don't hesitate to apply or contact us directly. Um, with that, Norman, um, I'm very happy to see your uh, your demo. Thank you, Stefos, and I'm very happy to be here. And I just want to share my screen.
So I'm actually sharing a um, Tidy Cloud here because all the libraries are set up and you can run a quick start notebook uh, locally if you wanted to. And I'm actually showing you here how to access that quick start notebook. So if you log into cloud.tidyb.com after signing up, you'll be able to click on the notebook tab and then you'll click on the tutorials LIDAR quick start. And that would bring you into this window here. And this is our notebook environment. And you can see that we're going to show you how to ingest the last file. And we're going to do this locally in this case, but then you could just easily do that to cloud storage as well. And we're going to use PDAL. We're going to use our tile to be integration into PDAL, which is developed by Howard Butler and this team. We're going to show you how to slice that LIDAR data natively from a tile to be array. And then we're going to show you how to visualize that within the notebook. So you're going to slice, you're going to do it all analytic, and then you're going to visualize all in one place. And then finally, we're going to show you how to run a SQL query on that LIDAR data directly from TowerDB. This is a self-contained notebook. You can, this will download the data and it will create your array for you. And we're going to use the well-known Outstone Point Analytics. So because I've already downloaded this data and we're in a workshop, I'm going to skip over some of these tabs. But you can see here, this is where you download the data. We're going to then run the PDAL info command on that to go and see the statistics. You can see we generate all the statistics here. We'll just zoom over those. And now we get to the interesting part where we're actually going to ingest that last file and create a TileDB array. So I run that command. If you're running this and you want to run it multiple times, this window here would go and clean up your previous ones. And then this is a, the PDAL or, or PDAL, I call it PDAL, the PDAL pipeline. And you can see here, we're going to read the file. We're going to, then going to run a, a statistics stage, and then we're going to output the array. So that's already been done. So we're going to skip over that because run, run that cell. And now we're actually going to open the array. So if you look here on the left hand side, here's the actual array, outsend.powerdb. And we have a look at the data, we can see the fragments. So we actually get two writes here that correspond to the chunk size. And if we look inside the fragment, you can see as Davos was saying that we're a columnar format. You can see all the attributes and then you can see our dimensions. So we're going to open that array and we're going to print out the non-empty domain. So the data is written in the native coordinates and the non-empty domain is the minimum bounding rectangle of that where you actually have data. So you can see that ran very, very quickly. Even though it's local, it's still pretty impressive. And we're going to open the array. There is the non-empty domain. So X, Y, and Z. You can see that here as well. And then we allow you to compress each attribute using a different compression filter. And that allows you to go and optimize your data. So for example, intensity here is using a GZIP2 filter. Uh, classification is using GZIP. And we can support any compression filter going forward. So we have a, a bunch of standard ones that you can find in our documentation. And we're adding to those all the time. Now we're going to slice the array. So I'm going to take a slice on X, a slice on Y, and a slice on Z. And again, I'm querying here in native coordinates. So we just uh, opened that array there, and um, we were slicing directly in native coordinates. And we get back, in this case, we get back a data frame. And a data frame is very useful for LiDAR point cloud data, because now we can do statistical analysis. We can find out there, so we can go and find the mean, the max, the mean, and do other calculations that your data science uh, users will be very familiar with. You can see that that query there, in it's local, is less than a second. And we retrieved um, 1.3 million events in that case. So very standard with a Python notebook is to go and visualize that data using matplotlib. So this is a plot function. And we're then going to plot that data frame. So here you can see the, the outside stadium, and we're showing that here in 3D. It's a static visualization. But a more interest, perhaps, is to go and use our integration with Babylon.js. And Babylon.js is an open source 3D JavaScript game engine that's supported by Microsoft. And we've written a Python wrapper around Babylon.js that allows you to display this as a, as a widget within a Jupyter notebook. 
So here we're going to define from the data frame, we're going to define our X, Y, and Z. And then we're also going to find our RGB, our red, green, and blue to go and colorize that data. And then you can go and adjust the, the, the viewport, the Z scale, or the value. You can do whatever you want as you expect with a, with a development kit that's based on 3D engine. So we're going to run that now. And here we can see we have the, the stadium here in 3D. And we can zoom in and we can zoom out. And you can see that data and you can pan around. We're now going to run a SQL command on that LiDAR data. So we have an integration here into server SQL. It's based on MariaDB. We're going to go and query that, that same data set and we're going to uh, print out the count. You can see we get the same count here as we do up here on the data frame. So that's the quick start notebook. And we went over at a very high level how you go and create a TileDB array, how we could slice that data, how we could visualize that data. And that in both running locally, that will also run directly against cloud storage. We're now going to move on to a more advanced demo. Here we're using the New Jersey 2018 LiDAR dataset of Northwest New Jersey. You can find it's available here on the AWS Open Data Registry. It was a 180 gigabyte of LAS files and once it was compressed, um, it resulted in a 51 gigabyte TileDB array. We're actually storing this on AWS and we're going to access this for a TileDB cloud service. Here we query the metadata shape files and we find that it's a projected coordinate reference system here. EPSG 6527. We can go and also find out the extents of that data from the data. We've already converted this data to a TileDB array and it's been registered on TileDB Cloud. Here you can find the TileDB array URI. Let's go and run this now. And we're going to print out the schema and the non entity. So here we can see the dimensions are X, Y, and Z. There is an arbitrary number of attributes that we can press with different compression filters, as we were saying before. We're using Hilbert cell ordering. And then going down here, we're going to do a slice of that data. Because we're a columnar, form, columnar format, we can just request that we only get the dimensions back, X, Y, and Z, because we're going to colorize this data. We're going to add RGB to it. So we don't need the additional attributes. So we're running this now. So this is querying direct, directly from cloud storage. It's going to take about 15 seconds. And it took a little bit over 15 seconds in this case. And we're going to see how many points we returned. And we have 15 million points there queried directly from cloud storage. In this case, a little bit over 15 seconds. So we're dependent on some cloud variables here. This query is coming in around about 15 seconds. The result is again a pandas data frame. We have X, Y, and Z, and we have uh, 15 million of those. We're going to do a, a quick visualization of this data just to go and see what it looks like. And we can see it's grayscale right now. It's a point cloud, but it's grayscale. We can see the high monument there in Northwest New Jersey. We can zoom in and out, and we can look around that data set. And we're now going to query a, a NAPE service, actually a WMS service, to go and get the, the image tiles that we need to go and categorize these points. I'm going to show you how, as a user, I would develop this NAPE book by creating the function, running it locally on a small area, and then scaling it out to the entire area. So we're using this WMS here. A WMS is a web map service, it's a big administration consortium specification. And we're going to use our integration into that stereo to quickly visualize the tile and make sure it's a little So here we're going to specify a width and a height. And we're going to use a get map request here. 
and we're going to request the data to come back in the same projection as the data set itself, so it's about 27. I'm going to do that now. We're going to use our tidy communication in the rest area and display the data. We can see here's a geo tip. There's a new data value of 255. We can see the extents and we can see the image tile. We're going to prototype the actual function here on a subset of that data. So we slice the data frame here. This is the actual function that we're going to be running. It's going to be called Compute RGB. Most of these Python modules should be familiar to you. We're going to use NumPy, Pandas, and Stereo. And we're going to have a fallback function. So in case we're blocked by the WMS or WMS went down, we're going to try a total of three times. And then if it's not available, we're going to use a, a cache that we have, just a tile DB base. So here we run that function. And we can see it computed in a, just for a local tile in three and a half seconds. We have the dimensions X, Y, and Z. And hey, look, we decided red, green, and blue to that data set. That's pretty cool. And let's visualize this in Babylon.js. And we can see that we colorize this tile and you can see the triple green values you'd expect. But it gets exciting now because we're going to create a task graph and do the, do the whole area. So not just that little tile, we're going to do the whole area. So now you can scale to a state. You can scale to a whole country if you wanted to. And you can go, you're going to take the coincident imagery of the point cloud and you're going to apply the RGB values to each point. So here we're going to go and create a task graph. We're going to have 100 nodes in this graph, and let's actually have a look at this. And then finally, we're going to concat the results. OK, so this is our task graph. You can see our 100 input nodes. So 100 input, input nodes are slices of the point cloud. And then also, we're going to take tiles from the image server, and we're going to project them onto the points. So just a quick summary. We'd loaded a point cloud, it was grayscale, just here, and then we added some color to it, just to go and test it out locally. And then we created a task graph for 100 nodes, and this task graph will scale across a partial state, a whole state, or even the whole country. And then we just got to the point of wanting to run that graph. So here's the visualization of that task graph. You can see the 100 input nodes. These are the, the regions of the point cloud. They're going to request data from the WMS and we're going to categorize the result. And then we're going to run that result here. And we can see that that task graph is now running. Green, green means it's running and then let's go to blue. This is going to take a little bit of time to compute. But the point here is that we can actually scale these up. So if, even though we're running over uh, Northwest New Jersey here, you can scale these out across the whole state and across the whole country. It is using service compute. We manage that all for you. You don't have to go and create this instance to yourself and manage that data. It's just going to just work. We can see that some of these nodes are starting to complete now. And they start being a little bit faster as so they're being able to finish up. There we go. And I quite enjoy watching this task graph. It's uh, quite, quite rewarding. Um, and then when it's complete, we're going to visualize it on the data frame. And we're going to show you the completely colorized point cloud again off of the video. So you are slicing cloud storage. You've done a quick prototype function. You then decide that your prototype function is good enough. And you're going to scale that out across the whole state. And rather than having to take you know, several hours to do that, you're going to do this in a matter of minutes. And it's just going to cost you a few cents. So we have about 45 to 20 seconds to go here. OK, and it's just compute disconnected. So you can see the result data frame here. We have x, y, and z. We have 15 million points. And look, we've added red, green, and blue to everybody, which is fantastic. This is quite a complex task. It's very computationally intensive, and it's just worked. So here again, we're going to assign this to our viewer. And 
and now we're gonna run, run this inside the yeah. And if, whereas before it was grayscale, it is now all colorized. And you can zoom in and out. And we still have a zoom. You can see the mon high monument just there when the cursor is. So that's showing you a complex analytic working directly with how to be place inside how to be cloud. I'm now going to show you how to do an ingest of second parallel. So we're actually going to use PDL for years. And we're going to have multiple NAS files in this case, 20 LAS files. And we're going to ingest these in parallel. We have 131 million points in this case. And I can see that um, we're coming up to uh, q and A's. So I'm just going to step through this one fairly quickly. We're going to import the modules that we need. You can see my input buckets and my create array URI. So I'm using this in my namespace, but then I'm going to actually create the array and register the tile to be cloud all in one operation. This is where I'm going to clean up any previous ones of the data. This takes a few seconds. So I'm going to amateur the array and I'm going to uh, delete my output bucket there from the SV. So that's just finished. So we're going to list our inputs here. Here you can see our, our 20 odd LAS files. We can scale these to hundreds, thousands. This is just free to workshop with a very quick example. Here's our PDL pipeline. It's going to take all the LAS files. It's going to write out to a tower to be array. It's going to specify the chunk size and the domain area. And here is our function to append to the array. So we're going to be creating the array, creating the schema as we're showing right there, and then appending in parallel. And we're going to create a task graph to do that. And we're going to do two LAS files at a time in the chief. So here's the task graph. And now let's execute that task graph. So we can see we're now creating the array. We're registering it with how to be found. And then where my cursor is, we're going to actually ingest each, one of the, each pair of those IS files in parallel. This is going to take a little, little bit more time to compute than the previous example. And um, but you can see how these could scale. We get a whole bunch of IS files we provided from doing a survey. We want to create one tile to be array, and then you can slice from that array directly. So the Create array schema is just finished, and we've ingested one IAS file to do that. And now we're going to ingest the rest of the data. So once that's you can see some of the tasks that we need to complete now. And again, this just costs you a few sets. While this is running, let's actually look at some of these tasks. You can see the tasks here as they're completing. So here is my array. I'm going to call it Norman and J ingest. And you can see how long it took to run. And the, the cost is less than the same in this case. And the task graph is just completed. It took just over a minute to go and ingest these files. So when it says 10, it should actually say 20, so it's doing it in pairs. So it ingested 10 nodes in uh, just a, a minute. Here we're going to do something called consolidate the complex data, and that's just a performance optimization. We're going to open the array just to go and prove that it will work and, and look at the schema. And you can see here we have our known to domain, and we have our tune of attributes, and they've all been compressed with different compression filters, and we're using the Hilbert cell order. So to conclude these three activities, we've ingested the array in parallel, and that allows you to go and ingest your data very, very quickly and very efficiently. We then applied an analytic, which allows you to colorize your point cloud, and we showed how that could scale beyond this one tile to a whole state or to a whole country. And then just to get you up and running, we showed you a quick start notebook of how to create an array locally that you could then go and copy to the cloud and how to go and query that data. I would like to give you a, a quick overview now of just how to do cloud in general. And then we'll take some questions. So this is the tile db dashboard. You can see I have 87 arrays in my account. Uh, I'm in three orgs. And you're going to have some credit when you send us cloud.tiledb.com. 
things you might have done for me. Within the array browser, um, I had some LiDAR data. I had some star data, synthetic aperture radar data. Uh, I also even had some sonar data. Um, this this TileDB is a universal data engine. We can really support all different data, data types. We look at the AVG. This is the data set that we were just working with. This is New Jersey Northwest from 2018. Here's my TileDB URI, how I access the data. Uh, it's a total of 51 gigabytes in size. We said that the original LAS files were over 160 gigabytes in size. It's a sparse array. And we've added a description here, so you can go and add some more data if you need to. We have a quick look at the schema in the array browser, again with the dimensions and the object attributes and the different compression filters. You can put different amounts of metadata here. Here we're using PDL metadata so we can define the coordinate reference system. We should see a whole bunch of activity, and we do. We can see I was running a UDF, I was doing a query, I was reading the schema. And now if I want to go and share the array, I can go and share the array with other people using their username or using um, their email address. I can share that here. I can share with Stavros, for example. I can give him read, write, or read and write permissions. And I can also invite him by email. So that concludes our demo. I hope you find it very interesting. I'm going to hand back to, to Stav Stavros and Mike in a minute for QA. I would like to say that we are hiring a Stavros and we would recommend that application. Thank you, Norman, and uh, a, a big shout out to, to Howard Butler for, for PDAL. We, we are using it extensively, right? And we saw this uh, um, in the demo as well. Uh, we have a couple of questions. So um, one of them is about whether we're going to be adding buffering for streaming data. This is a good question, but I need to provide a little bit more context for this. So when you do a write into TalDB, as I mentioned, we are creating timestamp fragments, and those are immutable. Once they're there, it's done. Um, buffering is important because if you don't buffer the data before you initiate the write to TalDB, you're going to be um, uh, submitting way too many write requests to TalDB and you're going to be creating tiny little fragments. Uh, and this will have an impact in performance if you have 50,000 of those or 100,000 of those. And that's why, that's why we're implementing um, features like consolidation, which compacts multiple fragments into one to improve performance. We have some other cloud native um, indexing that we're doing on the fragments. Um, buffering is gonna help in the sense that if you have a real time application, you're accumulating data uh, into the buffers, then you are minimizing the number of write requests uh, submitted to TalDB and therefore the, the number of fragments. Um, this is in our plans. Um, that's the, the question whether uh, we're, we're planning to do that. It, it's in our roadmap. Uh, we would love to hear more about the use case so that we know exactly what to do, like what is the API that the user is, uh, wants to use. We do every, everything with zero copy, which means you need to allocate buffers um, on, your, on your end. If we do it in the core, there's going to be a little bit of double buffering. So it's, it's mostly an API and the user experience thing rather than the implementation itself. So we would love to hear more about the use case. And the, the, other, the other question is, uh, is very interesting. It's about whether we can uh, perform classification of last data using TerraScan. So this brings me to another uh, extremely important uh, point. TileDB implements this feature called UDFs, User Defined Functions. And this is what Norman showed you uh, to do ingestion, to do the, uh, the colorization. Those were UDFs, Th those were arbitrary functions in Python, and also we, we support the same thing in R and hopefully in, in other languages as well, uh, which um, uh, which you can write. It could be anything. Like your creativity is, is, is unbounded. And then using those user-defined functions, you can create those task graphs that Norman showed for distributed compute. So theoretically, you can create any kind, uh, any kind of uh, code that even uses TerraScan inside the code, inside the user-defined function. And therefore you can build distributed classification algorithms in TalDB. Uh, this is the kind of infrastructure we're building bottom up instead of just going and building the classification algorithms themselves. I'm, I'm happy to discuss this offline um, for, for more details. Uh, I, I don't know, Norman, if you would like to add something. No, I'm good, that's good, that's it. Okay, uh, we have a few more uh, questions here. 
so I'll just run down some of them. I think the uh, the first one is, can you still use Hilbert ordering uh, with a time dimension, or do you need homogeneous dimensions? Might be a good one for you, Stavros. Yeah, this is excellent. You can use it. You can even have a string dimension and the um, UN64 dimension, the double dimension, and, and Hilbert is going to work. The way we do it is that we calculate, based on the number of dimensions, we calculate the number of bits that we're going to dedicate for the Hilbert resulting value per dimension. And then we isolate the algorithm on a per dimension basis. And we, we map from, from all of those values collectively into one Hilbert value, given those, this kind of bucketization. So first, first we discretize the dimension and then the Hilbert algorithm just works because the, the dimensions have, have been discretized, but you can do it even in strings. And uh, yeah, that, that, that was a very cool feature that, that we built. Okay, so we have a three part question. <laughs> um, so, so here we go, I'll read it. We're looking at generating and processing petabytes of LIDAR data coming from multiple LIDAR sources where speed of ingestion and processing is a crucial factor for our workloads. Uh, I'll just read the whole thing in its entirety and then I'll go back to the first part. So first question, are there slash where would the bottlenecks lie in TileDB currently for a petabyte scale solution? Two, could we run this solution 100% on-prem without depending on cloud that tile db.com and three if so would the solution run on a kubernetes cluster um i guess if you want to start with one with the uh, bottlenecks uh, and kind of go from there yeah great question so i'm gonna start with with the second and third if you don't mind they're brief <laughs> the, the first one um has a little bit more explanation uh, uh, entailed so um everything you saw in this demo the taldb cloud offering um, we host it as a SaaS product on the cloud, but the entire thing is deployable in, 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 your, in your environment. This is what we call TalDB Cloud Enterprise. Send us an email and we can discuss more about this. We do have customers that, that use that version. And this is completely under your control. Uh, the, we are not involved. The, the service does not phone home. So you have full privacy, full security within your environment. And uh, for, the, for the third question, uh, we run on Kubernetes. So you can, you can run TileDB Cloud in your Kubernetes, in your existing Kubernetes cluster. So that's easy. Now for the first one, TileDB Cloud or your infrastructure, uh, depending on how many machines you want to use, it scale, especially for ingestion, it, it scales linearly. So the more resources you have, the better. Um, there are two parts in ingestion, PDAL for parsing and then TileDB for ingestion. And we try to optimize this, both of those components as much as possible. But then you can scale the compute, right? If you have thousands of last files, you're going to use a handful of files per task. And then you can spin up thousands of tasks. The bottleneck in performance is not going to be in writing. The writing is going to scale very gracefully. So, so you're going to see how long it takes of, on one task to, to ingest the three files. And that's going to be very predictable. And then it scales linearly uh, based on uh, how many machines you have. The performance bottleneck is going gonna, is gonna to come in reads if you generate an enormous amount of fragments. If you keep your frag, let's, let's uh, uh, speak hypothetically, right? If each fragment is one gigabyte, you're going to have to generate a million of those for a petabyte of data. In that case, you will have to be mindful and generate fragments that are in the order of 10 or 100 gigabytes each so that you end up having, let's say in the order of 10,000 fragments. For 10,000 fragments, and because of this feature we have for consolidating the headers of the fragments, so very, very uh, light information gets consolidated so that we, we create a two-tier indexing, one for the fragments and one the R trees within the fragments, um, then performance is gonna be great. It doesn't matter, even for a petabyte, the performance is gonna be bounded by the S3 throughput. Or, or your distributed file systems uh, throughput. But th this is the thing that you should be mindful of. Don't generate too many fragments or consolidate the fragments after the ingestion. And this is something we can help with because we've done this a lot, especially for genomics. We have been ingesting hundreds of terabytes of, uh, of data for, for, for several years now. Okay. Uh, I have another one. Um, does non-empty domain uh, bring all the data in physical memory? For instance, 
if I have millions of rows of data in a sparse array, is it efficient to use the non-empty domain function? Uh, will it get all data in memory? Um, I, I, I'll, I'll try to, 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 to well, I'll, I'll try to clarify. Um, the non-empty non domain is just a bounded box and it's instant. It does not read all the data to calculate it because we store this in every fragment upon ingestion. So it's materialized, it's two values per dimension. So six, six doubles here. And therefore, and, and then we, we, we create a union of those if you have multiple fragments on, on, on the spot. So it, it consumes very little memory and it's super fast to bring in. So no, the non-empty domain is just a bounding box. So it's, it's very easy. No scanning of the data is involved. Uh, Mike, I think they, there is one uh, question missed uh, uh, at the top. So let me, let me answer that as well. It says, it seems opening the notebooks on, on TalDB Cloud is chargeable. Uh, is there a way to refer to these notebooks if I'm only going to use um, the embedded version? The answer is yes. Uh, especially the public, the public notebooks, you can, you can access them even if you're offline in, in a static view, just sign out. And then you can see from the explore page and uh, you will be able, if it's not there uh, yet, we are, we're working over the next couple of weeks the, uh, on a download function. You can just export it. And if, if there is only TalDB embedded code there, you can just run it. For example, the quick start that you, we showed you, that should run locally for you as well. It should, uh, the only um, command you need, to, you need to run is you need to install PDAL and we have um, a comment about how to do this. Thanks, okay. Uh, and uh, we have one here. You know, I understand that ingested data is saved to the cloud. Um, I'll just say it's, you know, it's saved in your object storage service of choice, not in TileDB, but I think that's what they mean. Um, and then if yes, how do you restrict or kind of ensure the general security of data? Yeah, th this is a great question. So you, and actually this is quite important. TileDB, especially TileDB Cloud, if we're talking about the service, does not host data. The data belongs to you. And we do this by choice. Like this is intentional. You can set up a bucket with your security guarantees, encryption at rest, you know, whatever, whatever kind of security guarantees you need to have. And we just govern it. Effectively, once you... Um, ingest um, the data in, in a TalDB array, you can register some key that you give us. That could be a read-only key, for example, for your bucket. And from that point onwards, only TalDB Cloud accesses the data. We do not disseminate this key to the users, especially if you are sharing the data with a hundred of your coworkers or thousands in, on the cloud. We never disclose that key. We, we have set up a very secure solution so that uh, every request is isolated uh, and, and secure. It slices the data, it communicates the data through REST to the users. And, and that's, that's, how we, uh, that's how we guarantee the, um, uh, the, the security of, of the data. If, if this is under your environment, you just control where you want to store the data. It could be Luster, it could be MinIO, it could be anywhere. Um, and then you're fully responsible of, of the security of the data for an on-prem deployment. Um, regarding the, the mixed projections, this is a great question. So there are uh, two ways we, we are exploring uh, at this point. The first one is to reproject to a common projection. This is not going to work all the time. Um, and the second one is to create separate arrays under a group with the mixed projections and make this logical group as a special array that handles those projections. And when a query comes, we will uh, we want to direct each of the query to the to the different projections in order to get the data back. So that's that's the way we're doing it. TalDB supports those logical groups. They're um, they're effectively direct. We have a hierarchical format. It's it's a directory structure, and the group is pretty much a directory with other directories and arrays. So this is how we're trying uh, uh, to tackle this. Okay, next question. If I also want to store the timestamp for the points, should I store it uh, as another fourth dimension and then say I want to retrieve last 30 seconds of data? Do I slice on the timestamp dimension? This is, this is great uh, as well. There are two ways you can do this. The first is exactly what you said. So you add time as a dimension. I would most probably add this dimension as the first 
the first dimension so that it's the most the most selective especially if you always slice across time and then it's just going to work um the second way to do it is uh, through the time uh, traveling uh, and the data versioning feature we have. So every write into TalDB creates a timestamp separate subfolder in the array folder. Um, and again, this is uh, in part because we want to be a cloud native format and cloud object stores have uh, immutable objects. So you cannot just go and update another object without a big penalty in performance. So if you do that, we have functionality. And also if, if the time of the ingestion reflects exactly the, the, the time of the points that you want to slice on, if that's the case, then you can slice across time without materializing this as a separate dimension. And this can have a lot of performance benefits because uh, TalDB understands all those uh, timestamp folders, it has uh, extra indexing on top of those, indexing the non-empty domains, bounding boxes effectively of each of those directories. And then it can slice very, very easily across the um, across those fragments in time. But in order to do this, the time of ingestion must be meaningful. Okay, one last question. What is the desired hardware? TalDB is super lightweight. It's gonna take advantage of all your cores. If you have many, it's gonna just use them for decompression, for parallel IO, for, you know, in several uh, parts of the code. Um, but there is there is nothing specialized. It can it can work on uh, um, very low powered hardware, or it can work on uh, it can work on beefy servers. And as we go, we keep on adding functionality for for GPUs, for FPGAs. You're gonna see this heterogeneous uh, um, compute hardware as well. But in terms of require requirements or specifications, it it works on multiple operating systems. It go it goes with multiple uh, CPU architectures. Um, if you face any problem or if you have a special request, just let us know. Okay. Okay. Uh, I don't see any more um, Q and A's in the panel. Um, is there anything, do you see anything that I might've missed, uh, Stavro? All right. Well, I think we will uh, wrap this up. Um, thanks everyone for all the great questions and for checking it out. Appreciate it.